Welcome back to Worlds 2019, where we're gearing up for G2 Esports versus Don Juan Gaming. Raz and Jat have joined us, and if it's show with one series into this day, I want to check back in with you. How you doing? Where do you land on the Deficio Happy Meter? I mean, people might think I actually am going to be super sad now that Splice got knocked out, but I feel like Splice played very well. Yes. A lot of people said 3-0 SKT straight up, so despite them losing, I actually moved up one. I'm ah, 5 out of 10 right yeah. now. Okay. Uh, I do believe in G2, and then I think Splice can be very proud okay. of the performance they just showed. Cautious optimism here. Yeah, straight, out of the in the middle, series straight in the middle. And ahead into the G2 esports series. I only have one concern. Both times when people ask you how happy you were, I answered for you and then you just agreed. Mm. Uh oh. Wait, so you didn't give me the five out of ten. You I, gave said, me the four I said out of ten. five. Were you <laughs> I didn't hear that. Incept okay, I didn't hear it. Jat's taking credit for Deficio's. You want your feelings. face up there? Super that nice. might be the first time in history I've ever seen <laughs> that happen. All right, I just well, wonder where it's supposed to come from. Like, what's he influenced by? Right? Who knows? Throughout this tournament, the players have been grinding in scrims and the ladder and specifically Jack, you wanted to go ahead and take a look and highlight some of the players who are competing here today yeah i mean Dalmon has been here since playing but of all the teams here at worlds they put more time into their solo queue accounts and it shows so the top five of the ladder right now actually canyon has taken rank one from caps caps is pushed down to rank two but then they have three overall players in the top five with showmaker at three and nagri at five so they're incredibly impressive in solo queue and that's obviously not the be all end all or will be series defining in any way but it does mean that they have incredible skill in these players and it's just another way to look at it they're grinding they're putting the hours in yeah and it's crazy that it's this team that really prioritizes that not only in just the uh korean server but they find themselves here and sure they were here since plans but the rest of the teams had quite a bit of chance and for them to be the ones that focus pretty heavily yeah. in solo queue to grind it out says a lot about their priorities and i do want to say it can actually have an impact because typically if you play this many solo queue games you get to test a lot of different matchups a lot of new picks that others maybe don't so it can give you an edge when it comes to adaptation on some of these different roles here it also means however you have to face the great eu solo queue players and maybe you get beaten down a few times and you get scared of uh, g2 right exactly but as you mentioned jet solo queue does not dictate necessarily yeah success on the international stage. This LCK roster of young stars, though, they step into their very first best of five at Worlds with everyone firing on all cylinders coming out of groups. And if we just talk about the group stage in general, I'd say Canyon was a little slept on before the tournament. He won. He actually won the MVP of the LCK, but that is more related to most player of the games. And we ended up seeing the player of the game version of Canyon so many times throughout the group stage. And we've also seen a team who I think started kind of shaking in play-ins. Like there were some hiccups and I, I wasn't super convinced when yeah. I saw them actually advance and then go into yeah. this group here with Team Liquid, you know, with IG. And I was like, okay, they can actually end up not getting out here. But I think uh, a bot lane that was heavily criticized coming into it has actually done perfectly fine. It's not yeah. been a, a weakness for them. And then they've been able to rely on these solo laners. And of course, as you highlighted yet, Canyon. And the most important, impressive thing for me about Canyon is that he's not necessarily being given lanes that are easy to gank and pressure for. That he's there to hover, allow them to kind of thrive. There is one or two games that specifically against Invictus Gaming where he just completely shut down Ning just mm -hmm. by being there ready for those ganks. So when he has lanes like the Vladimir top lane, then he's still able to let Nuggery thrive. And Showmaker has been incredible throughout the World Championship. If Dom1 is to advance and go all the way to, say, a World Championship, Showmaker would be a huge reason why and mm -hmm. whether or not he can actually dominate that mid lane. Throughout, he's been towards the top in pretty much every statistical category. I mean, Papa Smithy, top of the day, said there's an argument for Showmaker being the best Korean mid laner in a holistic sense. You might make arguments for one being sure. better as a laner or in the late game decision making, but Showmaker right. is the whole package and of course you'll have to put up a whole package performance today to come away with the best of five against G2. Now the team is also supported by a veteran coach in Coach Kim who guided the team IG to a world championship just last year. Yeah I think this one is actually pretty cool because Coach Kim was IG's coach in the world title. He was also Longju's coach in 2017 when they were actually the last team to go 6-0 in group stage at a world championship yep. and if you think back to any of those teams it's been this dominant solo lane play style that they then run over teams with. Mm. And that's what he has again here with Canyon and Showmaker. So there are some similarities. And even though it's a very inexperienced team, it's a very experienced coach, yes. which makes me wonder what type of level we're going to see from this team 
in a higher pressure situation now in the quarterfinals. That's something that I was interested in when, you know, he was with Invictus Gaming initially, the fact that they were very young players on that yeah. roster, and also the idea that there were a lot of challenges that he spoke in, specifically in interviews talking about the attitudes, clashing, just the ideas, knowing that he's bringing that experience onto the next team is always interesting to see. And I think one of the big things he's actually bringing that you can see is he allows players to take risks. He allow, allows players to come in with different picks, take 50-50 plays. Some coaches are like, no, we need to learn how to play the game the correct way, you know, where we don't take these big gambles. We have to set it up in, in a certain way. I think all three teams we highlighted here, we have had individual players who were allowed to really pop off, make mistakes, of course, but also then shine and actually use the mechanical skill they have to beat some of the best teams in the world. We'll see if the veteran coach can guide the young players to a victory here. But this time last year, RNG were heavy favorites in a quarterfinal, but they fell just short on the road towards that grand slam that they oh so coveted. Now G2 find themselves in a similar position, looking to do what no team has done before. It's the last hope right now. Fnatic lost yesterday, Splice lost today. G2, they are the team everyone looked at. They won, mm -hmm. obviously, Spring Spin very, very convincingly. Summer Split, they had to fight for it a lot more. Two times, best of fives against Fnatic. And then also, in the end, some shaky games against Griffin. So there's been enough reasons during the year to start kind of questioning what level are they at? Are they the best team in the world? I think still this G2 lineup are so hard to play against in these best of five series because champ pools are massive. They yep. can carry through all three lanes and even the jungle if Jankos is on. They form. haven't lost one this year. They haven't even lost the series. So yeah. I, I think yeah. G2 have a lot of tools that they don't necessarily get to show in the best of one. They can in best of five. And I think it's an important thing to point out. They're still the reigning MSI champions. Right. They still started the group stage 5-0. and oh. yep. No one else started the group stage 5-0, and oh, even though no one was undefeated in the overall group stage. And it was just those two games against Griffin that they're looking to bounce back from. So it is absolutely possible that G2 clean up their play, have Yankos and Mickey play amazingly, and get back to that G2 style that we saw so much of at MSI. What I love is the fact that they're incredibly self-reflective. And while you said, you know, making the point that they made mistakes in those two games. They also make the point that throughout the entire day that they've made mistakes. And a team that is on that path for the Grand Slam that has an yeah. eye on the prize, they will see those mistakes, work on it. We know the creativity of the team and how strong they are individually. I expect them to clean up all of that. Yeah, we're looking for Yonkos and Mickey X to step it up a little bit. I also want to talk about, though, perks in that ADC position. Creative picks uh, has been kind of the name of the game for this guy since making that role swap. What can we expect from him today? I mean, I think we can expect the classic AD carries and Kaiser Zaya, but I think we can also expect mages like Syndra, you know, other things that he can actually pull out that surprises people. G2 have a lot of ways they can utilize this bot lane. They can either start camping towards it with a lot of CC, you know, Syndra, Leona, Syndra, Pike, these kind of setups, or they put him on something where he can farm alone. He's actually fairly, you know, safe with range, and Mickey is then enabled to go somewhere else. And I also think actually Perks is one of the smartest players we have at understanding where he needs to be on the map past laning phase, which is very unique for an AD carry. Yeah, smart and incredibly consistent. I think of the uh, top eight teams that started in quarterfinals that I had him as the second best AD carry next to Teddy, right? I think that right now Perks is playing incredibly well, the best of uh, all the G2 members. So I think if we're just talking about what is the focus for me going into the series is how well G2 can provide, you know, resources and pressure for Perks. I am so impressed with what a good AD carry Perks has become a year after role swapping. In a lot of games, I felt like his AD carry has been better than his mage play. Do you, I have actually a question for you, Deficio. Do you All think right. with perks on AD carries, if he doesn't play mages, G2, mm -hmm. I, th I think they could still win with that. Do you think mages are actually better for him or no? I don't think they're necessarily better, no. I think he's able to win lane harder on certain mages. Syndra, again, being a big yeah. example, they can pull out in a game five. But I think AD carry still offers so much for them as a team because when he plays like Zaya, he actually goes to a side lane very often. He doesn't do mm -hmm. that on Syndra. He starts playing side lane. He pushes just the correct amount before he then leaves his team. And actually, when you play against it, you hate it because you have to defend on so many different fronts. And he ends up actually getting further ahead than you expect because he gets an XP advantage over your AD carry. And then he then carries the next team fight. So it's super frustrating to deal with him. Uh, been on that side a couple of times already. You can shut this uh, lane down. I, I will highlight that. I think Perks and Mickey do play very aggressive. 
and they're very, very deceptible to gangs. I think what's fascinating to me is that in this conversation around G2, one of the people we haven't talked about is the guy who made it to the World Finals just last year in the mid lane, oh, and that yeah, is Caps, cool. right? We cannot forget, you know, the experience and the pedigree of the mid laner mm -hmm. here for G2. That said, as is usual, or as is pertinent to pre-matches, we got to get predictions up onto the board. So, Deficio, will G2 take it for EU and keep the European hopes alive in this tournament? They will take it. It will not be easy, but they will rely on the fact they have a lot more versatility and they can adapt in between games because, as I highlighted before, they can play through multiple lanes. They don't have to rely just on solo laners. They have so many different picks they can go for early game, mid game, full late game as well. So, I think that's going to be the upper hand in a best of five. I don't think necessarily going to play a lot cleaner because they play aggressive. You will make mistakes when you play aggressive, but it's enough to beat them. All right, the G2 call here. I hear, I think in aggregate, this is the most stacked quarterfinal we have had this weekend. Yes. I think if G2 wins, it's because of experience and versatility, but I'm going to give the edge to Damwon because I think it could be, if Damwon plays well, a bad matchup for G2 because their top side of the map is so stacked that it won't need to play through nuclear in order to win. Raz? I agree with all of that. So I'm just going to go with G2. Because <laughs> uh, the experience. He made uh, it easy it for me. Be. He got the experience, the versatility. I think that'll carry them. All right. Well, the G2 vote there. They're calling it in a long one. To get us into the series, though, let's throw it over to Ibai for the team introductions. All right, maybe not the face you were expecting, but the face you're going to get. I'm Dracos. This is Zael. Vettius alongside us as well. We're going to be bringing the series today, but as there is a small delay on stage, we're going to be taking over and talking a little bit about the series coming up. And I'm with I'm with the side of the desk in the sense that not all the 3-2 predictions. I don't honestly know <laughs> what to expect, but in the sense that I don't know what to expect from G2 as a team because we've seen the great. And then in the last two games, we've also seen the... Let's call it questionable so, if you're being generous. <laughs> so I spoke to uh, Mickey before today, and I said, Mickey, how confident should I be in G2? And he said, all you saw was three best of ones. You haven't seen best of five G2. So you should have the faith that G2 best of five is going to show up. So that is what he has told me. That is what the expectation that he is setting. Whether or not that is true or not is still yet to be I don't think you seen. can let them set their own expectations, though. I think, I think the play has to speak before the players I mean, do. this is it. And this is what game one is going to be very much about. What will we see from G2? Because Jankos and Mickey have been two of the worst performing players that we've seen, especially in the group stage. But we also know they can have those incredibly high highs, that they can be absolutely dominant. We're talking about LEC MVP here in Jankos, who can have those absolute pop-off games. So despite the fact that he did not perform well on the Kiana, you know, got ran over by Tarzan, you know that he can do the same thing to other junglers when he's at his best. But the question is, can he do it against a jungler like Canyon, who has had a fantastic tournament so far? His early games have been flawless, clean, and impressive. Well, now with the players waiting in the wings, let's head on back to the stage. estáis? Bienvenidos otra vez, estamos aquí en la guerra, nos la vamos a jugar, pero yo os pediría, estamos hoy ante todo el público del planeta, ante todo el público del mundo, ¿qué ruido puede hacer Madrid? Demostrárselo a Rayo, por favor compañeros, esto no está en el guión, vamos Madrid, hoy se va a liar, hoy se va a liar, porque ya está preparado el primer equipo, que entre sí. En la jungla, Shakers.
En la calle central, el niño prodigio. ¡Cops! Como tirador. Como support. Mikic. Como suplente. Una leyenda. Lo ha ganado todo sin jugar nada, jugando poco. Es un referente. Es un referente. Pro Y como entrenador. Rops. Amigos y amigas, enfrente un duro rival, ¿eh? un rival muy complicado. También eh, quiero que recibáis con un fuerte aplauso al equipo coreano de Taiwan. En la Toblin, Nuguri. Como Kungla, Canyon. Como Midlaner, Show. Como tirador, nuclear. Como suplente, como suplente no, como supo. Le ha vuelto a cagar. Riot, sorry. Otra vez, como supo. Sorry, Beryl. I love you, man. Ahora sí, como suplentes. Punch y Hoyt. Y como entrenador, Kim. Amigos y amigas, disfruten del último cuarto de final. Vamos a ver si nos puede ganar. Vamos a ver si gana agua. Nos vemos. Hasta luego. Adiós. Of course, thank you to Ebi and uh, appropriate welcome as we now get ready for G2 versus Dan One Gaming. I'm still Draco, still Vedia, still Azale, and still have to see what level of G2 shows up today. I'm excited. I cannot wait for this. <laughs> I am really excited. Many people believe that this was going to be the closest series of all of the quarterfinals. Um, when we were talking about coming into this tournament, the three favorites were FPX, SKT, and G2. And the Dark Horses were Invictus Gaming and Darmon. Invictus Gaming has already made an upset happen by taking down Griffin. The question is, can Darmon, one of the Dark Horses, one of the expected up-and-coming teams coming into this tournament, perform like they have done through the group stages? and challenge the likes of G2. I mean, I think people want to see these LEC teams really be able to perform. Last year felt like the rise of North America, the rise of the LEC on the world stage. You know, LEC with a team in the finals, with a team in the semifinals, and people are hungry for that level of success once again here. But now we are left, no any teams even in quarters, only one LEC team remaining in the tournament. People want to see G2 show up. The last hope of the LEC, the last hope of Europe, on European soil, at a European world, that's a lot of pressure going on in this lineup. And we talk about, yes, Dom won the Dark Horses, but remember, the last few games that we saw from G2, 
It's looking pretty close right now. It's no longer pre-tournament favorites because we've seen the cracks in the surface for the side of G2. And everyone has been talking about how damn good Dom Juan is in scrims, that they are just running over teams, that these guys are solo queue monsters. We have seen that, you know, evidenced by their performance there and by the individual performances of really all their top lane and mid lane and their jungle. These guys have been just so dominant throughout the tournament. They certainly have. And G2, they've had a very messy group stages. They uh, A lot of the games were very high in kills. They didn't have the cleanest performances. We saw every single member, probably outside of maybe perks, arguably caps, just having a bad game where they were the sole reason as to why G2 was at a deficit. And what many fans want to see is G2 cleaning up individually and as a team, because domestically, they're one of the best at not necessarily getting early leads, but ballooning small advantages into big ones. So I'm expecting this game to be fast paced, high action, very similar to what we saw when we saw IG play, because these two teams have a very similar style. And it's easy for European fans to go, hey, that's a happy game. We've seen that from G2 before, but all it takes is three happy games in a quarterfinal, and you're knocked out. But as we now get closer and closer to the draft, Vettius, you're doing a lot of draft prep, you're doing a lot of research. What did you find? So I think Akali is something that G2 have to take off the board because they don't want to prioritize it and they want to take it away from Showmaker. The big question for me is, will they also look to take away Canyon's Talia? This was something that is he is very proficient at, offers a lot of die value, and is also something that G2 might not have an answer for. And I think that Talia, especially in combination with Barrel, who loves to play these engaged supports, has worked incredibly well. We saw in the group stage the Poppy-Talia combination was brilliant for them against IG, and Don Juan certainly have the ability to be very creative and draft. And you can see with the Quinn pick coming out from G2, heavily suggesting a Renekton first pick. Don Juan have to be aware that this is a possibility for them, and I wonder if they'll look to ban away the Renekton, or if they want to try and take the Zaya Rakan away from the bot side of the map. And we saw from Khan's Quinn earlier today, just miserable when the phase rush is there. So hard for Renekton to get anything done. I have to see if it's a different story, there though, as the is. final ban will come out, and it will be the Renekton forcing response out from the side of Dom 1. I think Gragas really does kind of rise in priority in a game like this, with Elise already off the table. If you want to have the ability to get proactive early in that jungle, bring some AP from the jungle. And also, both of these teams can play the yasuo Gragas combination, both mid-jungle and as bot support. Looks like... Uh G2 is going to focus in with the Zaya now. Wouldn't surprise me if Dom Juan go for the Kaiser. This is by far and away Nuclear's best AD carry. He looks the most comfortable on it. And as long as you pair it up with Beryl on an engaged support, this is a style that Dom Juan is very comfortable on. They're very good at playing through the bot side of the map, giving Canyon an early game jungler that he can find success on. And already you're seeing these pieces come together for Dom Juan. Yeah, I immediately think of something along the lines of a Nautilus to pair up with that Kai'Sa can work very, very well. G2 are going to get what they want here, though. Zaya Rakan, as well as the Gragas, you have that powerful engage now from the support as well as the jungle position. You have a scaling option here for perks. And also, one of the marksmen that has the ability to playmake. And I think that is something very important for G2 to have on perks because this guy really is an explosive player. And when you give him that flexibility, he can take over a game. And now even more pressure on the G2 bottom lane, because while they have secured their ideal matchup and now get to ban the supports away on the opposite side, the Kale has been locked in from the side of Dom Juan, and the Rise and the Yasuo answers you might have seen into it are now being taken away. So G2's options limited for those solo lanes. Something like Vladimir, I think, can be very strong if you want to scale alongside that Kale. I do think you can perform in the early game against it. I think that you can match and sometimes overcome the power that Kale provides in those late game team fights as well. I think that Jace is something G2 could be looking for at the moment. Um, they don't have a huge amount of AP damage outside of the Gargas, but I think that you would look to try and match as to where the, the Kale is going. And I think that right now with the Syndra likely going to be locked in, it is something that is also just very potent in the mid lane. So for me, it feels like G2 have pretty much got everything that they want because they have strong early setup. They have pretty solid scaling, but I really do believe that G2 is looking to go hard and fast in game one. Yeah, this seems like much more of an early mid game focus to me from G2, when you were going to pick Jace and Syndra against you know the likes of a Kale and a Kai'Sa and these sorts of champions, you do want to be able to punish. You want to be able to put the pressure on and make these plays happen because if Kale is able to stay at parity, if Kale is able to hold even in this lane, we know how good of a player Nagari is come late game and how dominant that Kale Kai'Sa can be sending this Kai'Sa into the backline with that Kale ultimate easily set up for 
by the Leona with that ultimate to stack up the Plasma. So certainly incredible engage options here. And what I think is really fascinating about this matchup is, given the setup, Darmon would typically leave their soul laners in isolation and would heavily look to play through the bot lane. Try and get Nuclear and Barrel into a position where coming into the mid game, they are strong. Whereas G2, you would expect them to be playing much more around their solo laners. They want to try and get the Kale behind. We should expect to see Mickey roaming around the map a lot. So I actually expect both teams to be playing on opposite sides of the map. And a lot of this early game will come down to who is able to get to their win conditions better. Can G2 snowball or can Damwon hold the line? A lot of pressure once again. All damage in the early game for G2. Very execution heavy. Don won't always have the opportunity to fall back. Time to see how their bottom lane will stack up against the Zaya Rakan for Perks and Mickey X in the solo lanes as well. A mismatch here could be disastrous. Here we go, the last hope of Europe sets foot onto the rift for their first game in this best of five up against Don Juan Gaming. And I immediately want to jump into any level one potential plays, largely because when G2 get their hands on Rakan, they're always looking to do something creative with the pick, whether it be look for secret flanks or trying to force all ins, and it might just be getting some vision on the red buff for now, so nothing too explosive in game one. They will get that ward down and Mickey perhaps wanting to check things out over here by this blue buff, but relatively safe start to the game. It is just going to be the trinket war drop. You can see Yanko's going back to base. Will change out for the sweeper here. So wants to be able to play around vision, wants to be able to create opportunities and zones of threat especially around this mid lane. And this ward is very important because remember what we were talking about in draft. Damwon with this kind of a comp would typically look <laughs> as the as Dom1 and G2 have a bit of a laughing contest on the bot side, um, Dom1 would typically want to play through bot side. So by getting that ward on the red buff, you get an idea of what Kanyan's early game path will look like. Whereas G2, you expect them to start on the bot side, do a full clear bot, and then path up towards top early because Wanda will have a wave that'll stack, and Yankos will either look to cover or they'll look for a kill onto Noggery. I think something Damwon also may do here is focus towards the mid lane. Lee LeBlanc, incredibly strong 2v2. This is a pretty skill-based matchup in the mid lane between LeBlanc and Syndra. And if you can get control of that mid lane, you can then take that pressure with the pushing waves mid and roam bot as that four-man squad. Try to use the Leona to not just set up for the Lee Sim, but also the LeBlanc, who does want to get unlocked and be able to move around the map. For now, Lee Sin is on the top side, starts the red, opts to go into the Raptors, can look to go Krugs for a quick level three. We'll see though where Canyon wants to put his attention. Expectations as laid out in pick ban are for the solo lanes. For now, Cap's taking the bad end of some of these trades, forced to extend the trade to even it out, but he does manage to do so with the force of the So you can see that Canyon is gonna go for a full level three by doing a full clear on his top side, and Yankos is going to mirror. Meanwhile, lanes across the board, relatively even. Perks is able to get an early push alongside Mickey in the bot side of the map. This isn't too surprising. And as you were saying, uh, Azale, LeBlanc versus Syndra, very much skill-based. Uh, and in the early levels, because of the higher damage that comes out from LeBlanc, you expect her to be able to get this push. But the lane I'm most concerned about for both teams is this top side of the map, because yeah. it's actually in a pretty neutral state, and you expect both junglers to be passing towards here relatively soon. Wonder also getting pretty low here does actually spot out Lee Sin so they are going to have the knowledge that Canyon is walking over to this side of the map and Yankos did already go back get his Predator boots so he is ready to go but may run into Canyon up here. And with the Predator probably wants to find bursts oh. if they're going to get anything done. Canyon. He doesn't have a he does have one ward so he could actually look for a ward hop if Wonder got too low but I think Wonder has, has started chugging a lot of these potions once he saw Canyon was in the area. Oh, this is going to be difficult. It's getting lower but the kick has connected. Who's going to grab it in the end? Canyon will take away the blue buff getting some control on that top side. And unfortunately for G2 they the solo laners cannot support Yankos because Showmaker has good pressure in the mid lane and because of a few favorable trades for Noggery he also had a wave set up top so it was going to be easier for Darmwan to be able to collapse which meant that Yankos forced to concede that buff. 
while Kale has a very weak early few levels, if you do connect with a number of Qs, it starts to snowball because the E is missing health damage, right? So if you do get hit by some of these Qs and you do get chunk low, the E starts to become way more threatening and you can get in situations where you can maintain an early push. And for now, Wonder able to hold on to a little bit of a lead. Both take, uh, top laners taking Kleptomancy, so neither one going to pull too far ahead there. But the red pot going to feel very good for Nagari as he gets back to lane. And Cap's forced out, forced to TP early here, but we'll have a small item advantage over the likes of Showmaker for at least the next few moments. Yanko's going to try to use this mid lane pressure to move in. Still only level three. Kenny about to hit fours. We see a bit of trading bot lane. And then Mickey threatening. Snare will connect, but they're not going to fall with anything else. Perks very quickly running out of mana, however. Has to be careful. Probably can only go for one more big trade here. Yanko setting up over the wall. Oh, this is a huge wave here. So Showmaker really does need to get it. It looks like it's going to be a move up to the top side. We have Nagari under the turret. The wave is being set up here by Wonder. Yankos and Caps are going to make this roam. And even if Nagari doesn't die here, this is a fat wave that he's going to be missing out on. Caps not spotted. Nagari just going to back off. Oh, that hurts so much. Look how many minions there are. There's 10 plus minions and a cannon that he's missing out completely. And we went from dead even to 20 CS advantage in an instant. Fantastic play from the side of G2. Nagari doing fine that individual 1v1, but a good use of that mid lane pressure. And a lot of it comes from that early base from Caps. How he played the laning phase was he was giving up health purely to spend his mana on farming. By doing that, he guaranteed a slight lane advantage at the cost of no mana, but then he could early base, spend the money, and then he could look to TP in mid to set up that wave. Now, Canyon looking for a play bot. Then we'll connect. Knockup is there as well. TP, coming TP in. now coming to the bot lane. They need to take down first. The Perks is flashed out. He's brought it back. And now they've been locked up. Barrel going to go down for first blood. Wonder is here as well, but Nagari has joined the fight. Another TP coming in. Showmaker on the way. Dom one commit everything, and they get Nothing. Massive win for G2. They get the kill onto Perks. They get double TPs there from the Damwon solo lanes. And Damwon gets nothing back. And Nagari's wave top lane is absolutely ruined. It's going to be slow pushing away from him. So if you thought it was bad that he lost all those minions under the turret getting zoned off, this is going to get even worse. He could be down. 50 CS in a matter of minutes. And now Mickey is setting up a freeze on the bot wave, but this is what we expected in the draft. We thought the Canyon would look to try and play through the bot side of the map, and look at how quickly the teleport comes through. G2 are ready to respond. And due to some beautiful play from Perks and Mickey, through having Mickey stick around, tanking a lot of the damage, then using Perks to get out to safety. Yes, it cost them a couple of summoner spells, but they were able to find a kill. They were able to burn both teleports out from Nogari and Showmaker. And G2 now find themselves with a 1k gold lead. And I think Nogari had no business teleporting to that fight. You're a level 5 Kale. What are you really going to contribute there? And now he's going to be so massively behind as we see Wonder is going to pick up this huge wave. Nagari is going to be way down in the experience, and it, it can be pretty difficult to play out a game from this type of position. And if you're a G2 fan looking back at those Griffin games, seeing the way that Mickey was caught out repeatedly, that is exactly the start that you want in a best of five as Caps. Now starting to pull ahead in some of these trades, but overall, G2 looking much more confident than the last time we saw them. Yeah, they certainly are. They're not being over eager to try and force anything. They're just managing their waves so well in this early game, and they're working with pressure. They're not trying to force plays unnecessarily. And now that the bot lane has no summoner spells, this is when G2 has to be at their most cautious, because you would imagine that Canyon will look for another play on the bot side. He has just crested that level six mark. He has the kick available, and it's very easy to set up plays with the Leona in the bot lane. Wonder though, looking for the all-in, but he doesn't realize Canyon's here. Divine Judgment has now come out. Canyon now trying to come in. He's going to get kicked back. We'll guarantee the Sonic Wave follow-up. That's going to be it for Wonder. Canyon gets the kill. That is critical there for Dom Juan. Wonder was pulling so far ahead in this 1v1, but Wonder had no vision in the river, no flash available, so Canyon elects to go top lane and does punish that, and that is going to help Nogari to stay alive in this lane. Does give an avenue though for Yankos, knowing that he's isolated on the bottom side. They can force a 3v2 situation. But Nuclear and Barrel are not going to take the bait. Barrel has to be careful about stepping forward, however. And critically, Yankos isn't six. I'm not sure how close he is. He just got it off the minion, so now That's they're going to go. Be huge. Channeling Predators now coming out. Has to flash away from the knockup. Yankos is going to commit to the play anyway. That's the knockback. Nuclear flashing out. Good patience. Good movement coming in from Nuclear. So G2 are able to force two flashes out from Dom1's bot lane. 
Fortunately for them, they can make some sort of trade happen, but Canyon now back out onto the map. We'll look to start passing towards bot, and we'll see if he can make anything happen back as G2 looking for another skirmish in the bot side. They've set up the wave beautifully once again, as this wave should actually be pushing towards Mickey and Perks. Oh, okay, never mind. They've just ch changed that. They want to try and get the push in, then go for an early base. See what items they can pick up for now. Perks and Canyon, neck and neck in terms of the overall gold value. Canyon has been having an incredibly solid early game performance. 57 to the 41 CS of Yankos, already finding that kill on the top side. You're going to have to respect that warrior, Lee Sin, so strong at this point in the game. And again, look at the positioning of Noguri. He recognizes that people are missing. They could look for a dive, and every time there's a snack, oh, we see a fight pop. He's going to find the knockout. Canyon's on the way down. The ultimate now coming out from Mickey. He's going to try to retreat. Perks with no flash available, but does have the ultimate. Canyon will not connect the Sonic Wave, but should indicate the stop in the play. He's trying to force out the ultimate for Perks. Perks waiting as long as possible to do so. Showmaker on the way in, and now Perks is vulnerable. Canyon, is he going to take this kick in? Yes, he will fall up on a Mickey. Showmaker now coming in. They will not find the snare out of the Blanc and Perks. That should be it. He should be dead, but the heal comes out. Perks is still alive. Mickey's still holding on. The kick comes in from the Lee Sin, but Mickey trying his best to turn it back. Damwon coming out on top. And it ends up with Damwon finally finding the play he's bought that they wanted to make, but it's not at the cost of nothing. G2 are pressuring on the other side of the map, and it is a constant tug of war between these two teams, constantly trading sides of the map, trading some of the spells, and it looks like in terms of the gold, G2 are going to come out on top. I think they're going to come out way on top. Look at all these plates. The solo first turret gold is going to go over here to Wonder, and we are quickly approaching that 50 CS deficit that I had mentioned earlier. Wonder is going to be so far ahead of Nagari, and G2 have just done an excellent job of slow pushing the top wave, getting pressure mid lane, grouping up with a jungler, and zoning KL off experience NCS time and time again. You can see this enormous difference. And just fantastic from Wonder after what looked to be pretty close at level three. Nagari now has to be careful though. He's just gonna get taken out. This Divine Judgment will not He's save gone. him. And that's it. The Kale knocked out of this game, the flash out to safety, but the barrel just for style points to finish him <laughs> off. Yankos really wanted Perks to get that kill. <laughs> Perks Obviously doesn't want to commit the flash there though, so once Kale flashes away, you just take it as the Gragas. And if we just look at the state of the map right now, G2 has so much more control. Because by taking down the top tower, this now opens up Wonder to start moving around the map. And it also gives Yankos a bit more freedom to invest in his bot lane. And this is when we get to see a bit more of a G2 classic, where Mickey and Yanko start becoming this roaming death duo. They will group up together and they'll start moving around the map to set up vision, look for picks, and if they can, they're going to look to try and contest this rift turn. Have to keep our eyes on Wonder. We'll throw down the Empowered Shock Blast. You'll know that this is happening. A Control Ward as well gives them loose information. As Perks is just going to start breaking down these tower plates, though. The Rift Herald really only going to guarantee two, so Perks happy to make this trade as he'll be able to grab a few for himself. Mickey now poking his head in, just trying to threaten, but there is no backup there. Yankos has opted to use this time as a back, and Damwon going to make up for a little bit of that bot pressure by grabbing the Herald for themselves. I think it's a smart play from Damwon. Just try to play where you are strong. Try to play away from G2 because G2 is in such a commanding position on that top side of the map right now. You do not want to have any sort of a fight involving Wonder and Nagari if you are Damwon. It's a good, as you rightly said, good trade. Um, largely because they know that Perks is eventually going to take this tower. There's not much they can do about it. So to be able to regain some map control and a couple of plates, they will use the Herald up towards top side. Uh, and this also allowed Mickey to come up and help support G2. So again, we've been talking a lot about ebb and flow back and forth. And it just feels like G2 have been coming out ahead in a lot of these trades. Largely just because it feels like they have read what Darmon wanted to do and have done everything in their power to try and stop. And these matchups are, are so interesting for me because when you are playing up against a Kale, there's so much pressure on the opposing team to get something done, to really execute on it and create these advantages. This is what we were talking about during the last series when we were watching Lucian into Gangplank. And I think that G2 have really shown exactly how you can create those advantages, even if the Kale player is playing smart and not dying in lane. Nagari actually never died in the top lane, but got so far behind because of how they're manipulating the waves, because of how they're timing their roams with the mid and jungle. And I think this is something that is really beautiful to watch from G2 and so well orchestrated. And what does it mean for the mid game? Well, Dom One now don't have that many options because the Kale hasn't even completed the first item yet. Whereas G2 have so much gold on top of Wonder. And at this point with a single item, both Caps and Perks feel very strong. It just gives G2 a lot more freedom to set up for the Drakes, siege up onto the mid tier one. And it's 
up to Dalmon to play more on the defensive. They have to slow the game down a little bit now because they're going to have to wait for these item spikes to come through and they're going to rely a little bit more on the scaling aspect of their comp to be able to turn this one around. And to be able to do that, they need to make sure that they're at least maintaining some level of vision. Because if you see all vision on the map, Kale cannot actually step forward and get this farm. It's a very dangerous place up here right now for Nogari. There's no tier one turret defending him. There's no wards whatsoever, but he knows he needs to reset the wave and Looks like he will be able to do it because they don't have the information on where Canyon oh. is at this moment. Has to be careful. The Wonder's just waiting in the darkness. He's okay giving up a couple CS because if Nagari missteps there, he goes down in the 1v1. But we said this before, early game dominance, we knew from the start. This was the MO for G2 and they have found success. But for Damwon, now they need to hold the line. Now they need to survive. And they're so far, they're struggling. But without a mid lane tower broken down yet, it's hard for G2 to further snowball this lead. And, ooh, hang on. Oh, good awareness there from Mickey. Not going to fall for that trap. And uh, when I was watching a lot of the games for Dom 1, something that they were very good at was punishing the mistakes of their opposition. And they would get large early game leads thanks to Canyon. And then coming into the mid game, they would find these opportunities where they would punish and they would rely on Beryl to force these engages. But they don't have a lead. They're at a pretty big deficit. So I'm curious as to how Dom 1 now adapts their mid game. Will they continue to try and force fights as they typically have? Or will they just kind of take their foot off the accelerator and just completely slow the game down, set up a lot of defensive vision. Because right now we're seeing a lot more defensive vision on the map and it seems like Darmon are going for more of this defensive approach. I think the plan is going to be play away from the Jace for the rest of this game until Kale gets to late game. You look for 4v4s. If Kale shows top, you look for a play on bot side 4v4 because gold is still fairly even if you're actually excluding the Jace and the Kale from the picture. And I think Darmon will feel comfortable to take those types of fights but they have to make sure that they're never in a position where the Kale and the Jace are involved in the fight because in those situations, they're such a disadvantage for them. And inevitably, then we have to look at the duo currently on your screen, Showmaker and Canyon. Showmaker doing fine, relatively even in the mid lane. Canyon with a lead of his own. So maybe they can make some picks. Maybe they mm -hmm. can slow down the game. There should be some options. You have a LeBlanc, you have a Lee Sin. You can still one-shot someone, even if they have the slight gold lead. And we saw them looking for that over by the blue buff, but Mickey was able to suss it out. He was able to detect the fact that these guys could be waiting in that brush. Because if you do face check into a Lee Sin LeBlanc, you can get popped. <laughs> you should get popped. <laughs> Just a miserable situation to play against. But even then, you see Wonder playing very far back, does not have information on the Lee Sin, waits for him to be spot on the ward before he steps forward. But now Nagari has to be careful, wants to break this tower down, and will be able to do so. And that is because, again, they got vision on this upper side of the map. You can see all the wards in the river that Damwon have actually committed. And that is trying to get gold on this Kale. That is saying, if our Lee and LeBlanc are off the map, Wonder, you don't get to play League of Legends. You have to back off now. The shoe is on the other foot. And that is buying time for Nagari to get to a stronger point in this game. I think for G2, what they would like to do right now is set up for a play onto mid. Um, they've done a pretty good job of controlling the bot side of the map, which has kind of put Wonder in this situation where he's like, well, I have to catch this wave, but I recognize that my entire team is on the other side of the map. And you can see now Yankos hovering around his top laner to make sure that he is very safe. And I think that what we'll now see is Zaya look to push up bot, and then we'll see the Jace come up towards mid with the Gragas, and they'll look to try and threaten this tower, because now with the plates down, it should be a lot easier to siege. And with the amount of poke that comes out from a Syndra and a Jace, it should be possible for G2 to be able to take this tower down and then they can start pushing their vision further up into the enemy jungle. And I think that's a great idea because if you land a little bit of poke even from this Jace, from this Syndra, you have the go button of the Gragas, of the Rakan, who can then threaten to dive in and finish off those kills. So G2 have set themselves up well and that is why we see the Jace going up this mid lane. They're looking to try to set up this sort of a situation, but it does start with getting vision out around this area so that Jace and Syndra have these angles to poke from that Damwon can't necessarily see coming. You also want to threaten a flank, and you can see how Perks pushes up bot and then moves in with Mickey into the jungle. This forces Damwon to respect that a dive could happen, and now they yeah, find the pick. Big ol' caps, they manages to find the kill there. Meanwhile, Nagari just farming on the bottom side, doing what he can, but this is gonna be the mid tier one broken down for G2. And Dom1 did not respect it. We talked about how they needed to respect the possible dive. The setup and execution was flawless from G2, and they will turn it into another tier two tab. Beautiful play from G2 Esports. That is two turrets, and it's just gonna be a TP back to defend their tier two. So Kale not really able to answer too much here. The only thing Damwon got was a bit of farm on their carries on Nuclear and Nagari, and they lost 
both mid lane turrets, which is going to mean they're going to see control in their jungle. They're going to see control around that barren area. And that is so problematic when you have these champions like Kale who are not very safe and need to get farm and experience. And it's one of those things where we talk a lot about how G2 know how to balloon an early gold lead. And it's because while they are known for their skirmishing, their individual players, they're also very good at recognizing how to play smart League of Legends. And the reason why we could sit here and talk about this is what G2 is going to do is because it's textbook. It sits there. It's it's um, a very obvious play that Darmwon did not respect. And it's largely off the back of this early game advantage that G2 have built up for themselves. And now Darwan really have to avoid trying to fight. They've now got the Gunblade on Tanoguri. They have the Luden's Echo on Showmaker. And the best hope that Darwan can look for is like trying to find picks with the Lee Sin and the uh, LeBlanc. Uh, alternatively, or they just um, look... I mean, it's hard because of the gold <laughs> deficit that they find themselves in. So, like, I honestly like, just wait, feel they like... Wait, they can do this. Oh, no, never mind. Wait, wait, wait. wait, 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 there. wait they can go top. Oh, uh, no, no, uh, no, uh, no, never mind. And that's the power. Once you break down that mid lane tier one tower and you get to put all this vision in, as you were talking about, Azale, look at this. They have four people stacked just to make sure the Kai'Sa can get the wolves without dying. <laughs> But it's also just about how... It's a nature retreat. <laughs> it's about how G2 are using their pressure that is so impressive to me. And look at how they maintain full river control across the entire map. And now they're setting up for the mountain. Jace will push up top. He'll start walking down to mid. He'll catch that wave. And then they can just set up for that objective easy peasy. And I wouldn't be surprised if G2 also look for an early Baron because that's the best way to force Darmwon into an early fight, which G2 is very confident they can win. It is. And this double mountain will set up really well for that because now all of a sudden you have to respect the threat of that objective going down even more quickly. This is just very textbook play from G2 and they're executing incredibly well. Push out top lane from Wonder, move down to mid lane, get mid lane control, move into that blue buff jungle, get full vision in that area, and the drag hasn't even started spawning yet. So the only thing that G2 are now worried about is the risk-taking nature that Dam One has. They are known for doing 20-minute do barons, and now they're going to try and force it. Risking a lot here. Nagari, though, level 12 of the Divine Judgment. But that is very bold call from Dom One. But they kind of have to out. because of the situation they find themselves in. They know that after G2 take Mountain, the Baron is the next play. So they're like, maybe there's a small window where we can sneak this one away, but G2 have too Whoa. much vision. Barrel committing the flash. They're trying to catch Wonder, but not rewarded with anything. And, and I, I respect the attempt, right? You go for that. If G2 is five man on the dragon, sleep with the wheel a little bit, you get that Baron, hey, you're right back in it. You have to take your shots at plays like this, but as soon as G2 sees you, they can just split up their numbers, have one or two people doing the dragon, the rest of them can harass around that Baron. And a 20 minute Baron does so much damage to a team like Dom Juan that you can't just really do it in the face of your opponents. Yep. And it's clear that that was kind of the plan B. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about plan A. I like to call it Project Nagari, uh, called get the Kale to as many items as humanly possible, because this guy has been a huge force. Yes, you normally associate him with picks like the Vladimir, but the Kale is still that late game powerhouse if they can get to a stage where they can stabilize the game and puts a lot of pressure on G2 to close out as quickly as possible. It is possible that they can get him to that stage, but as you get further and further behind in gold in the matchup, it kind of pushes that point where you can take over later and later into the game. And normally, Kale kind of turns online at two items. In this game, I think you're probably going to need three before you're really becoming relevant in that 1v1 against Wonder, and that's still going to take him quite some time. And as you two fish for a play there, we can check in on Wonder's build. Has opt to go for the tier uh, build into the Mount Immune, into the Black Cleaver, so will still be much stronger than the average full lethality Jace on two to three items. So look at how G2 have now abandoned bot lane. They do not care about this tier one tower. It doesn't matter. The gold, irrelevant. What they do care about is utilizing numbers advantage to force their way into the enemy jungle and setting up vision. They have top wave pushed in, they're pushing in mid lane, and now they can look to force a fight around Baron. And G2 also has no TP, so they're trying to force the TP out of Nagari. So it's a job of the rest of the Damwon members to hold the line here and buy time. Because if Wonder goes down to answer that Kale, all of a sudden Damwon can make a positive numbers play on the top side of the map utilizing that teleport. And you can see Showmaker, Barrel, everyone on the Damwon gaming side is trying to hover in the fog of war. They still have a lot of CC, they have a lot of engaged threat. Yes, they might not be able to kill all five members of G2, but they can get a favorable fight if they can pick off one. And this was huge for Damwon because they actually didn't buy the, the bait, right? They stayed down there. They held onto the TP. Nagari's going to have to get out of here. He could get caught by Wonder. We'll see. Shock blast into the brush. Oh. Will miss. Oh! He missed.
misses the blast cone over the wall and the shock blast into the brush. He's going to be scratching his head when he looks back at that one after this. That can be game changing. If you get caught there and you kill, G2 may have had the confidence to actually start a Baron and try to really challenge Damwon. Instead, he gets to take the tower for free. He's actually closing the CS gap quite a lot. He's hit his second item. And he's going to be feeling really, really good about these last couple minutes. Now the pressure, once again, continues to be on G2 to try to find a setup, to try to get something done. Maybe the Baron is an option for them, but do not want to just go in 5v5. The double mountain, not enough to make sure that they get untouched by the Baron in the coming fights. Don't have that true tank with this composition, so you need to be careful about committing to this one as Caps just throwing down some spheres, ready for the setup over the wall. And you have to give so much credit to this four-man squad of Damwon, who have been doing a really good job maintaining vision, not getting engaged on, not getting caught out, because it's not as though G2 doesn't have great engaged. They have the Gragas as well as this Rakan. And many teams in this kind of spot would have just gotten picked off, would have actually already died and seeded the game. But they have really been holding the line, making sure they keep their vision pushed forward far enough to continually keep tabs on this Baron, and also buying so much time for the Kale. So my theory is that they're waiting for Perks to hit his next item, which I believe should come through any second now. There it is. Okay. <laughs> uh, so this was the moment that I think G2 is had a few more Ws for. there. <laughs> uh, because you've now got three items on the Jace, you have three items on the Zaya. Oblivion Orb is also completed for Caps. And I think G2 is now confident in saying, all right, any fight that down one take against us will win. And so this is when I expect G2 to be a lot more aggressive. And again, we see Wonder grouping up with the team. Even though his TP is up, they want to leverage the fact that they have five people. And the wave, I believe, is slow pushing in the bot lane as well. So G2 are in a position where they're saying, all right, Damwon, no more stalling, no more slowing down the game. Time to fight or time to lose. Perks even just grabbed his red buff. So he is ready to go. This is about as strong as you can be at this point in the game. They're forcing some recalls out. Showmaker, of course, has the TP, wants to go back and finish up an item. Maybe the Banshees to come out just to give him a little bit of safety up against the Syndra, up against the pick potential of a Gragas Rakan, and that's the TP coming in. They're going to try to commit onto Showmaker. Mickey still has the dance to get out to safety if he needs to make his way out, but TP forced out, meaning G2 are feeling pretty comfortable. No surprise flanks going to come in unless Nagari wants to get real aggressive on that Kale, and that's the start to the Baron. The rest of G2 just trying to body just block. Just doing it. They have the double mountain. Look how quickly this is going down. Feral, though, is going to step this one out. They are going to pull back. They're just baiting. They just want Don Juan to come into them. They want to take this fight. They've got the three items on Perks. They're going to try to engage. They're going to force the alt out early. Barrel's going to be locked up, but he might give his life, but it's Showmaker on the flank. Perks will not get locked up. It's a massive, but nuclear in the midst of the team. The Kale ulti comes down, but they play around it well. Canyon now has to go down, though, in the midst of the fight. Oh! Showmaker coming in! Is that enough, though? Three carries still strong on the side of G2. The supportive members have been taken down. It's a double kill for Perks. Still an even exchange overall. A very close fight between the two teams, and it's because Beryl soaks up so much of the damage. With the Kale ultimate and the tankiness of Leona, Damwon actually uh, stall out the fight long enough to allow Showmaker to come in and actually swing the fight into a very even situation. This was the best case scenario for Damwon. It was. You got to see that kale Kaisa combo at work. It was a snap engage here from Damwon. I'm actually surprised they decided to opt into this fight. I think they could have just continued to buy time. But it is a good engage nevertheless. You can see them flying in. Showmaker getting so much damage off with the distortions. And there is the KL ult plus the nuclear Kai's ult flying into the back line. But then this moment right here, flash distort. And you can see uh, at the end of the fight as well how low so many Damwon gaming members were and how close that fight could have been. And of course that and your what's your move replay. Brought to you by Axe Gaming. The move was survive. Hold on. The KO will be more powerful. And if fights keep going even, eventually they're going to shift in the favor of Dom Juan. So once again, pressure is on G2. Nagari is now level 15, closing in on the permanent exalted status at 16. You get so much more damage at that level, as well as the additional range. He's working towards his Lich Bane. That three item mark is really where things are going to get tough. You can just straight up start winning those 1v1s very comfortably through short trades against that Jace. When you have a Lich Bane, one Q plus an E auto with that Lich Bane proc can really chunk out someone like that Jace. So it does get difficult. And Damwon have bought so much time that this gold lead, I think, means very little at this point for G2. It's going to come down to execution. They have not yet been able to find the forces on the kind of fights that they really did want. And one of the hardest things for G2 is that they don't have any true Ooh, tank. this could be big. I don't know if they see. Oh, they do. Yeah. Do they see him? 
Waiting in the they darkness see. to come around the corner. Nagri, they're going to try to force an alt out early, but Nagri's quite strong. Probably not strong enough, though. Divine Judgment coming down. It will not connect. Cap's going to look to finish that one off. That's but huge. Wonder will grab the kill. That's a big pick, and you can immediately see you Dom one heading to Baron and be like, get as much vision down as we can. We need to be in a position where we can contest this Baron. But for now, G2 is saying, we don't care about the Baron. We're going to push in bot. We have a big wave. Now we're going to force you to choose because G2 can two-man the Baron with Yankos and Perks, which means that G2 can just threaten these two situations right now. And Nagri's the only teleport available for Dom1. So if Showmaker shows down here, G2 can actually start up the Baron. And they have kind of checkmated them at this point. They're threatening the Baron. They have no one that can answer this, or G2 will just do it for free. So now it is in this no-win situation. G2 are just going to be able to take the inhibitor. Exactly what they wanted in the exchange, putting Dom1 game between a rock and a hard place. There was no right choice for them to make. They'll give up the inhibitor in the process. Madrid comes alive as G2 finally break the base of Dom1. And it was such a smart decision as well. Not only were they able to find a pick on to Noguri, but many teams would just commit to Baron and say, hey, we're 5v4, let's just play for that objective. But they realized, we can two-man it. We have Double Mountain, we have Zaya plus Gragas, who've already proven that they can melt through this objective. So let's just actually keep the map split and force Dom1 into this situation. We'd be like, uh, 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 and then they couldn't decide what to do in the pressure, <laughs> so they end up losing their bot lane. Anyway. It was great decision making. Also, a lot of credit to tracking the teleport cooldown on Showmaker. I don't think that they go for that sort of play if they don't know that the teleport is down. So G2 really making it work after a good 10 minutes of stalling out where it felt like the game was moving more and more in Dom Wan's favor. G2 find a huge pick and they survive. The problem that G2 is still going to find themselves in is that they don't have a dedicated tank that can just sit there and hold on to the Baron, which means they need to either find a good fight or a good pick. Which means Dom1, they're actually, it's not the end of the world. They, yes, they lost their bot in here, but Nogari is gonna keep farming up. He has good wave clear. He still has his teleport available. So the responsibility still falls on G2 to force a play, which always means that Dom1, as long as they play safe and patiently, uh, are still in this game. And Nogari's 16 now. And a level 16 Kale eats those super minions alive. We'll see if they want to fight here. Showmaker is pathing down, but Dem1 want to maintain control of this mid lane. And you can see both teams playing at the edge, trying to stay out of max range of either side's respective engage They're options. Just take the turret. Now Dom1 want to force G2 between a rock and a hard place. They want to push down the mid lane. They're going to look to break this tower open. G2 will have first access to the Baron, a massive wave pushing bot side. Nagari does have TP, but these supers will need to be answered. Wonder not going to get picked off on the side. 7k health. Baron dropping. Barrel on the way G2 in. G2 split, Canyon though. on the way in. They need to back off. Barrel into the midst of the entire team, and that's nuclear right into the backside. Perk wants to get something done, but this might just be the fight. Canyon goes golden, tries to buy a bit more time. Wonder going into the backside as well. He sees his opportunity. Caps still alive, but Canyon will he react? Made the feathers oh. from downtown, and Perks might have just saved the his TP life. Base. The TP coming in, and what a perfect G2 way to potentially end the game. Caps has he overstayed. Super minions will come down. G2 will be forced to back away. Dom1 Gaming will stay alive for now. But we're now seeing how these fights are going in Dom1's favor. The Kale is doing so much. Beryl can stall for so long, and the combo of Kaisa and Kale in the late game is just so difficult to deal with. The critical mistake there was Wonder separated from the team. He was looking to actually play interference, but as soon as they spot Wonder here, they know he cannot now join the team. Wonder has to run the long way around, so Beryl says, let's go. In goes Nuclear with that Kale ultimate. The Kale ultimate with this AP Kale dealing so much damage in the back line, by the time Wonder gets there, most of his carries have been shredded, but that feather pull there from Perks, getting an additional kill, may have saved them from losing a Baron. So close, and you can see the pressure that G2 is in. They have maintained such great control, pretty much for the early to mid game portions, but they have not been able to secure this Baron. And without the Baron, it is very difficult for them to end the game, which means Dumb One have just been playing patient. They've been buying their time. And now G2, they're trying to put their foot on the gas once again as they knock on the doors of another inhibitor town. Hard forcing mid lane, opening themselves up to a flank. Dom1 Gaming, though, we will just pull back, we will just defend the inhibitor. Big chunk of damage down on the nuclear, but G2 take control for now. It only gets harder in the upcoming team fights. Have to execute flawlessly, or they will find themselves outscaled. I mean, we said this game was gonna, we said this series was gonna be close, and both these teams are demonstrating it now. The individual prowess is fantastic on both sides, and now that Showmaker has hit level 16, this LeBlanc also cannot afford to be underestimated. If she catches you out of position, that's going to be a dead or at the very least a chunked out target. But G2 now on the back. 
Mickey now pulling back. Wonder doing a lot of damage to Canyon. Lee Sin chunked out very low energy. Might not be able to make it to the pit in time. Zaya has been getting stronger and stronger. Can they get this one? Canyon, can he make his way into the pit? Can he be the hero? But he can. He flashes in and maybe just to his death. G2 will take the Baron. They'll take the jungler too. And now they're going to look to end the game. And G2 finally get the objective they have been fighting for for the last 15 minutes. With the Baron buff and with Canyon dead, they have their eyes set on Dom One's Nexus. Yankos buying time, stopping the recall from Barrel. It'll at least be a second inhibitor. They have a creep wave to back them up. Supers are crashing in on the bottom side. They want the end. It's only one Nexus turret, and it is a 5v4 with Baron. All eyes on Showmaker, Nagari, Nuclear, Barrel, Candy, protect them. Will it be enough to stop G2's onslaught as they push in? The Baron buff backing them up as they move in. Barrel fishing for the engage, looking. Nagari doing a lot of damage, but here comes Mickey X looking for the engage. The Divide Judgment, Nuclear into the backside. The Kaisa is big, but not big enough. Goes Golden buys a second, but it's just a brief moment of pause before the game will end. G2 coming through. Showmaker and Canyon will not be enough. G2's going into the fountain as if they could do anything else to end the game. And in style, G2 will close out game one in this best of five series. Whoa. An impressive early to mid game from G2, but Dom one they held on extremely well. We questioned what they would be doing in the mid game, and they took a defensive stance. They maintained such effective vision around their half of the jungle. They never made that Baron easy for G2, knowing that they had no dedicated tank, and then Noguri was just farming up in a side lane, waiting for that opportunity, and then when they were finding those fights, they were often coming out either even or ahead. And while Don Juan did such a good job of holding on, the key thing for G2 was that they never really relinquished map control. Yes. They had such a good area of vision across the map. You know, when you look towards the end of the game, when G2 is actually rushing that Baron, really the only vision at all that Dom1 has is shallow wards into their own jungle. And it makes it so hard to always be ready to respond to these plays. G2 pushing up mid lane, forcing Dom1 back into their base, and then rushing straight to the Baron. Dom1 didn't have time, essentially, to slowly check all the brushes and move forward safely as a squad to get to the Baron. But what we can say for sure is that it seems like G2 have gone the int out of their system from group <laughs> stages. They have definitely cleaned up their play coming into this series. And now the adaptation needs to come from Dom1 because they know G2 is looking and willing to play an effective early game. Will they look to do the same or will they continue with the scaling approach? I think there's something else we can say for sure. We are in for a treat. This is going to be a hell of a series. Two teams very evenly matched. Execution on both sides was incredible. Couldn't ask for more. Absolutely could not. All I can ask for is for game two to get here as quickly as possible. But for more on that game one, let's head over to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you very much, Dracos. Uh, Azale took the words right out of my mouth. We are in for a treat of a series of game one is any indication. But G2 come out on top in this one. And I've got Deficio here to help me break down where those early game advantages came from and then how G2 expertly maneuvers the map in order to extend those advantages. First and foremost, let's start with where they found their lead. Yeah, we really want to show how G2 as a team they don't necessarily get these leads individually. It's actually very smart map plays, very good setups they have uh, for, from them. Some, but they constantly pull you around the map as the enemy team, and you feel like you don't have a real answer. This is the first one. Early roam, Caps loves to do this when he has a great first recall into a quick TP where Yankos is covering for him, so he knows he's not getting ganked. Then they roam top, deny a bunch of CS, but that's actually not the important part. The important part is that Wonder now will get the best recall he can possibly ask for. He does not need to TP back to top lane. He can save it. He's calling to his bot lane. Guys, if enemy jungler shows up, I have TP. I can be there instantly. So he gets to save that key cooldown. They get to play aggressive, takes the skirmish. Jungler shows up, instant TP response. And even 2v3, they actually end up outplaying this. Nuclear does not want to flash forward because of a TP coming behind. Mm -hmm. And this entire thing is just a setup from Mid lane recall into TP back to lane when jungler is covering him, so he will not lose anything. Roam top, deny CS. You don't have to then use your TP back top lane, and you can use it bot. It's literally three lanes working together at the exact same time. In a lot of ways, this is not necessarily something new to G2. At MSI, we were talking all about Caps' willingness to sacrifice his mm -hmm. own lane, to get to the side lanes, and really propel G2 ahead. And so, great. They've now secured their early game advantage. But there's still a lot of work to be done. 
Yes. So now I want to roll forward to the mid game and talk about that map play. This is the strongest thing about G2. It's not the first 10 minutes, it's what they do in the mid game. It's how they take down all the tier one turrets. I'm just going to roll the clip here. You're going to notice how multiple G2 members are recalling together. The objective now is to split up the map but only pick one key objective. In this case, it's going to be the mid lane turret. So how do you get it? If you're G2, you're going to send your AD carry and you're going to send your support to the bot lane. This is because your AD carry can instant wave clear and push up and he's safe because he has, of course, the ability with Zaya to always just hold up if he gets caught up. And he will have his support with him because what you actually need to do here as G2 is when you have to push you know, up in this lane and you have to push down in this lane here, you want to start setting up in the enemy jungle on the bottom side. That's your strong side right now. So there are a bunch of wards right now from down one. That's what you need to clear. So when we actually run the clip, you will notice how G2 are getting guaranteed push in two lanes as we try and hit the screen. It's all right, we'll get we it. we get it there, right there. <laughs> so when they push up here, five members, you notice how Wanda has moved into the mid lane as well. Meanwhile, Kale is stuck top. This is a dead lane for G2, and it's on purpose. They know they get pushed on bottom side. They know right after they don't hit this turret. Do not hit the turret. You want to go to mid. That's the one objective we just highlighted. And when you move in, what you notice again is how anyone from down one who tries to defend, they have to leave. This guy right here, he's like, ooh, can I do something? No, you cannot, because the second you see them leaving from bot side, he has to back off. You can kill wards on the way. You now have two choices. Either you stop enemy team from defending, like they do here. LeBlanc's only wave clear is W forward. Mm. That's five members. You, you risk dying. If LeBlanc does not W forward here, you can just go back to the bot lane after you kill all the wards and do the exact same thing again. And G2, when they set up these kind of plays, they stop you from defending, because you have no wave clear at this point. They set up kill threats, and they get the key objective. It's such a smart play. Five members, meanwhile, you barely lose anything top. It's like one wave. Who cares? You sink the backs, you spread the map, you converge mid lane, you get a kill, two turrets for it. Yes. Astronomical advantage is garnered by G2 there. Of course, the game didn't end just there. It still took a little bit more work, but this is exactly the kind of play that makes G2 great. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to try and figure out exactly how you might attack this if you're Dom Juan. How do you dismantle the G2 play style or at least respond to it so that you have a chance? Yeah, I feel like that you illustrated there, Deficio. It all started with the Kale, right? It all started with the Kale who was mm -hmm. unable to get a lane priority because they wouldn't be able to match because they'd lose it anyway. So I would see Dom Juan try to go into the next game and do everything they can to get two winning lanes, right? Because that game, they had maybe one with the Cinder versus LeBlanc, which right. I feel like Caps ended up winning. So Dom Juan would need to do at least something to get the edge because as I think G2 showed there, they're playing very well. And once they had that first wave advantage, they just took the pressure all throughout the map. Raz, what are your thoughts here? Because in particular, uh, one of the other things that jumps out to me in that clip is the mastery of some of these G2 players on their champions. In yes. particular, we already talked about the near 2v3 in the bot lane. Perks sure. on the Zaya. We got Caps with his comfortability on the Syndra. Again, if I'm sitting in Dom Juan's shoes, I feel like I'm at a loss here. Yeah, I think playmaking from material, I love like Gragas and Lee Sin as picks here. Leon is a really tough one. Because the issue here is while it can give you a way in and a lot of siege opportunities, it's just a one-way street. And a lot of the times it's super easy, especially with the Zaya Rakan, to get out of those situations. And that's why that linear playstyle is difficult. I think the Leona is an issue if you want to be able to stop them. If you want to play a more, you know, scaling style, I don't like Leona as a pick because there's not going to be necessarily enough follow-up to push them off the turret. I think if one of your star players is your top laner and you're on red side, you want a winning matchup top. You want yeah. a matchup, as you highlighted, Jeff, yes. where you can carry through it. You stop wondering him from going to mid lane and sieging that turret because he's under pressure. You don't do that with Kale. Well, I got good news for you then because G2 selected blue side, so they're gifting that chance, opportunity then. of a red side counter pick over to Dom Juan in game two. We had an amazing game one. I can't wait to see what the teams break out in game two after the break. To the bot lane, they need to take down Perks. The Perks is flashed out, he's brought it back, and now they've been locked up. Perks, that should be it, he should be dead, but the heal comes out. Perks is still alive, Mickey's still holding on, the kick comes in from the Lee Sin, but Mickey trying his best to turn it back. It's a massive, a nuclear in the midst of the team. The KL ulti comes down, but they play around it well. Canyon now has to go down, though, in the midst of the fight. Oh! Showmaker coming in! They need to back off Barrel into the midst of the entire team, and that's nuclear right in the backside. Perks wants to get something done, but this might just be the fight. Canyon goes gold and tries to buy a bit more time. Wonder going into the backside as well.
Well, he sees his opportunity. Can they get this one? Can he, can he make his way to the pit? Can he be the hero? But he can. He flashes in and maybe just to his death. And in style, G2 will close out game one in this best of five series.